Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session. I would like to uh, introduce Bharat Kapoor, who will be kicking us off. Bharat. Thank you, Vanessa. Greetings, everyone. My name is Bharat Kapoor, lead partner in our technology practice. Uh, it's my pleasure to kick off the Future of High Tech series uh, on behalf of our technology practice and our policy think tank, the GBPC. As you are all aware, technology's impact on our world is increasing exponentially. We find ourselves where technology is no more a topic of macroeconomics, but it's ever increasingly becoming a part of national security and national sovereignty debate. Today, we explored the same topic with Admiral Stavridis and Eric Peterson. Eric is my dear friend who is the managing director of our global policy think, think tank called GBPC. Apart from being a policy expert, he's deep into policy implications on technology and vice versa. Without further ado, I'm going to request Eric to introduce the Admiral and kick up. Welcome, everyone. Many thanks, Bharat, and greetings to all from Washington, D.C. Uh, let's kick off with three quick uh, housekeeping points, if we may. First, I'd like to remind you that this session is being recorded. Second, uh, we have the benefit of having an artist from the Ink Factory in Chicago, Diana Fowarshny, with us. Uh, to create live visual notes of this discussion, and we'll have the chance to review her work uh, at the end of our session here today. And finally, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom right of your screen. Please use it. Uh, your participation is more than just welcome. We're counting on it. So now, uh, let me begin. It's hard to imagine a better way for us to kick off this series of discussions on the future of technology than having a conversation with the individual who I have the privilege of introducing today. Warrior, scholar, business leader, uh, technology observer, and also now, and he'll say a few words about this novelist. Our guest today, Admiral James Stavridis, has a highly distinguished record in multiple fields. As warrior, he is a retired four-star officer in the U.S. Navy. He led the NATO Alliance in Global Operations as Supreme Allied Commander earlier when I first had the privilege of meeting him in an earlier CSIS identity that I've had. He was serving as commander of U.S. Southern Command. As scholar, the Admiral served as dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where he earlier he earned a, a doctorate. Uh, as business leader, he is now an operating executive at Carlisle, focused on advising on geopolitical and national security issues. And throughout this remarkable career, the Admiral has been tracking shifts in technology that are at the core of so many of the key drivers of change now at work. We've been extremely proud to have Admiral Stavridis with us at uh, the Carnegie GBPC CEO retreats we conduct around the world. And I wish to extend sincerest thanks to him for joining us today in this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, we want this conversation to be as interactive as possible. So here's what we propose. We'll devote roughly half our time to a fireside chat format, and then we'll open things up to your comments and your questions. So please uh, use that uh, Q&A button uh, liberally at the bottom. So, uh, Admiral, uh, thank you so very much for being with us, and uh, we're just delighted to, uh, to begin uh, this uh, discussion and series of webinars uh, with your great insight. Let's start here with geopolitics, if we may, where you have such a commanding heights view. Uh, and we should begin with your take on the Biden administration. How is it approaching geopolitics, uh, the global technology race, who are the actors? What is your take on where things are? I think we're off to a good start with the Biden administration. Um, let me stipulate that I, I know all of these individuals deeply and well. Uh, I spent four years as Supreme Allied Commander while President Obama uh, led that administration. And that's kind of point one, I think, Eric, is uh, everybody in this administration who's going in in the zones of cyber, Homeland Security, National Defense, Geopolitics, Diplomacy. Literally every one of them is jumping up a position and brings real experience to the table. That, that's quite significant. Number two, and I can tell you this personally because I spent so much time around them, this is uh, a no drama zone. 
Um, and I think, frankly, that's something we're all uh, hungry for at this stage of our national journey. Um, we, I think, are looking for an administration that kind of takes some of the emotion off the table. And where I think that'll be most significant, by the way, is not only internationally, but inside the administration in how these leaders interact with each other. So people like Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, Lloyd Austin at the Pentagon, et cetera. That group, very collegial. They are, if they were a basketball team, they're not interested in who's going to be the most valuable player. They want to be someone who can lead in assists on the court. They want the whole team to look good. So experience, collegial, third and finally, mentioned it earlier, but clearly this is a team that wants to engage internationally through our alliances, through international organizations. They've rejoined the Paris Climate Accords. They are uh, looking at whether or not it makes sense to go back into the Iranian nuclear deal. They're working closely with Japan as they structure our positions vis-a-vis -vis China in the Pacific. Um, at every turn, and I'll close with Venezuela going to the Organization of American States. So um, it's an, a team that is experienced, collegial, and instinctively engaged in the international world. From where I sit, that's a pretty good starting point. Admiral, if we could uh, pick up on the point that you raised about Sino-American relations, clearly that is a, a tremendously important uh, vector in terms of uh, how things progress, not only through this, uh, the next four years of the Biden administration, but beyond. Um, and certainly uh, technology competition is a critical factor there. Uh, as you're fully aware, uh, President Xi Jinping has called for China uh, to become a science and technology superpower uh, we've been tracking fourth industrial revolution uh, technologies across the board. And uh, to be sure, um, that uh, is certainly um, a focus for competition between the two uh, economies. Um, what is your point of view on this? How do you uh, see this competition unfolding and how does it factor in the broader geopolitical uh, the scope that I know that uh, you're, you're looking at? Yeah, let, let's go to the dark end of the spectrum first, because I think it's important that we understand what it is we're trying to avoid. And what we're trying to avoid, and the reason my 10th book is a novel, is because it's set in 2034, about 15 years into the future, the covers over my right shoulder here. I mention it because it's about a war with China. The title is 2034. Uh, a novel of the next world war. And I wrote it not as predictive fiction, but as a cautionary tale, Eric. And I am very concerned that the two nations could sleepwalk into a war. Um, we avoided that during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. We avoided it by a micron. We avoided stumbling into a nuclear exchange, of course, in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. We put the hands of that atomic clock right up next to midnight. We've got to avoid that with China. And could we have the events that I talk about in here, which includes, by the way, a massive cyber event? Could that happen? Unfortunately, yes. So let's stipulate. Let's all be in agreement on that. You can disagree with me on anything else I say today, but I'm sure you don't want to end up in a war with China. So that's the dark end of the spectrum. So now let's walk it back to the current situation. Um, we have a basket, a significant basket of disagreements with China. Uh, intellectual property theft, the South China Sea, which China claims in its entirety, uh, trade and tariff disagreements, cyber activity. We're already in a kind of a shadowy cyber conflict, the 5G controversy, it's a pretty rich basket of disagreement, Eric. And now you just drop COVID right on top of that. And many in the United States watch what's happening. Where did the virus come from? It came from China, it came from Wuhan. Did China uh, cover itself with glory in the early days, preventing the spread? Absolutely, they did not. 
Um, should there be an accounting for that? Yes, there should. Um, on the other hand, we ought to recognize that China has uh, come out of COVID, not out of it, no one's out of it, but is making the turn toward normalcy, if you will, much more swiftly than the rest of the world. That in and of itself will create more discontinuity and disagreement between the United States and China. So again, far end of the spectrum, we, we know we want to avoid a war with China, but near term, we have got to construct a strategy so we don't end up over here in a war, but still deal with all of the issues I just mentioned. So what should we do? I think we should construct a strategy. That's where I fault the Trump administration, which um, was very engaged on China, but it was, it was quite episodic. Um, what I think the Biden team will do is bring the experts in, put Henry Kissinger, if you will, metaphorically in charge of this thing, and look at strategic blends, military, cyber, economics, culture, an understanding of the history of China, international legal norms. You get the idea. We need a holistic strategy. And I'll summarize and conclude by saying that strategy should be the following. It should be a strategy that says we will confront where we must when there are gross violations of human rights, when it looks like China is going to invade Taiwan, if China decides that they are going to enforce ownership of the vast South China Sea, we'll confront where we must but we should cooperate wherever we can. We should find zones of cooperation with China. These could be environmental. They could be humanitarian. Why don't we work together to prepare for the next pandemic? They could be economic projects that benefit both of us by improving growth in parts of the developing world. Again, there's a whole sequence here, but I'll finish by saying we need a strategy that blends those elements together. That's what we've been lacking and I'm hopeful that this administration will take up that challenge. You know, for whatever it's worth, uh, our council has done some projections about uh, a rise in mercantilism on a bilateral basis between uh, U.S. and China. And it reinforces your point, Admiral. Uh, the upshot there is that it would benefit uh, both economies to, in effect, stand back um, and to find the kind of cooperative ways uh, that you're talking about. Uh, obviously, it has to be a balanced relationship. But yeah, this me, leads me, me to an me, interesting... Please, go ahead. just make one final point on that, which is, you know, we don't have to guess uh, what it's going to look like if we get into a mercantile war with China and if we uh, end up constructing trading blocks, building tariff barriers. We already did that. We did it 100 years ago. We did it exactly 100 years ago in the 1920s. We created trade barriers, the Hawley-Smoot tariffs. Uh, we brought our troops out of the world. We brought them home. We refused to join the League of Nations. How did that work out? Well, we cracked the global economy. That was a major contributor to the depression. And you can drop a plumb line from that to the rise of fascism in the Second World War. I'm glad your group is assessing this because we need to put facts and figures behind it. But bottom line, nobody wins a trade war. Uh, President Trump said many things I disagree with. He said some things I agree with. But when he said early on that winning a trade war, ah, that's easy. We can do that. Wrong. Nobody wins a trade war. And we know that because of history. Great. Thank you. Um, just if we could drill a little deeper, we'll come back to cyber in a minute in 2034. And uh, I understand that uh, a, a significant portion of an upcoming uh, uh, edition of Wired is going to be featuring uh, part of your novel. Congratulations on that. Uh, but I, the one thing that we're tracking quite closely are national capabilities and technology. We've seen the whole semiconductor uh, issue right now, the whole chip uh, gap that exists. And uh, that kind of underlies discussions that I think have been magnified and amplified by COVID about uh, self-sufficiency on a national basis. And that takes us back, as you say, Admiral, to 
of what happened uh, 100 years ago, of course, so in a very different world, but nevertheless, uh, very strong analogies. But as you think about our technology endowment right now, uh, how do you see, uh, you know, with uh, all of the connections you have with, uh, with uh, the people who are movers and shakers, how do you see that falling out? Are we going to be pushing for higher levels of self-sufficiency? Um, we are, and we should, is the short answer. But we can do that without building massive trade barriers, trade walls, and becoming um, utterly insistent that everything has to be made in America. There's plenty of argument for lots of onshoring strategically. So what should be onshored? Um, you've touched on it. I think the very high-end technologies uh, to include, as you and I were discussing a bit earlier, um, quantum computing and what drives quantum computing. Um, and that's everything, frankly, from rare earths, uh, materials to programs, patents. Um, we're going to need to ensure we have a strong capability indigenously in quantum computing. Um, likewise, coming out of the pandemic, I think we've learned strong indigenous capability in every aspect of responding to zootropic pandemics, which uh, newsflash, this won't be the last one. And uh, of course, again, history shows us 100 years ago, Spanish influenza infected 40% of the world's population, by the way, with a 20% mortality rate. Today, probably around 1% mortality. The next one could be worse. So we need to have indigenous capability in medical response. We were okay there, but think of the early days of the pandemic, the scramble for ventilators, the scramble for masks. I mean, think about that. We had people get out sewing machines and make masks. That's not our prepares for the world ahead of it. Um, so we could kind of go through each industry but there are going to be plenty of things that it's just fine if they get made in Latin America, Africa, China, Malaysia, Vietnam. Uh, you know, I really don't care where my, my docksiders shoes come from. Um, but I do care about whether my nation has a sufficient supply of N95 masks <laughs> the next time this happens. So again, we need a plan to do this. I'm, I'm encouraged again by uh, the basic thinking I'm seeing coming out of the team in the uh, White House, look for an emphasis on onshoring, a, a little a dose of made in America in the diet, but not uh, a rush to just shut down our connections with the world because down that path doth madness lie. I'd like to uh, note in passing that uh, while we were researching the Admiral and preparing for this session, uh, we found, and I'm sure that there are earlier ones than this, but we found a 2017 speech that he made a warning about the possibility of a resurging pandemic. Uh, so congratulations to you. Uh, so many of us were surprised, and I know that's been on your radar screen for a long time. Yeah, I have never, never wished in my whole life uh, how sad it made me to be right on that one. But I, I have been talking about it for about 10 years. Again, history. Pandemics hit the human species about every 100 to 200 years. It's a given. And if you look at MERS, SARS, Ebola, this was coming. And the good news, I guess, Eric, is we will have learned a great deal. We will be vastly better prepared. The cost will be 500,000 American lives before this is said and done, I suspect. If you'll allow me, let's uh, change gears. Uh, cybersecurity, which I know is something that you're intensely uh, interested in, uh, in uh, thinking through. Um, we've, uh, we've had a couple stark reminders of late about how significant cybersecurity and vulnerabilities can be. Uh, the you're, you're joining us from Florida, Admiral, and the remarkable report that we had an attack on a water system in a small town there is only the latest. Of course, the big significant one was what seems to be a systemic uh, attack on uh, U.S. government. Uh, could you help? Could you help lead us through uh, what what the state of affairs is and what we need to be thinking about? 
I can. And, and let me start by saying, um, you know, I was looking at pandemics a decade ago. I started coding in 1976 in BASIC and Fortran, COBOL, when I was a midshipman at the Naval Academy. I was an electrical engineer because there wasn't such a thing as a computer scientist. I've been focused on what is today called cyber and cybersecurity throughout my entire career. Um, when I was Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, people would say to me, oh, Admiral, what, you know, what really keeps you awake at night? You know, is it Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, piracy? You know, I had a lot of problems uh, I was dealing with Syria. But the thing that kept me awake at night and still keeps me awake is cyber and our vulnerabilities there. Um, Eric, you're exactly right. We've kind of seen a big and a small example literally in the last week of this. And uh, let's I am in Florida. Um, this is a water treatment plant, as you mentioned. It's in central Florida. Serves a small town of 15,000 people. Hacker got in, unknown reasons. Maybe it's a latent ransomware play, who knows. But upped the amount of lie that goes into uh, this town's water supply. Here, you need to understand something. The U.S. water uh, grid, if you will, is not a grid. It's an enormous mosaic, tens of thousands of tiny little water treatment facilities um, all around the country. We, we don't have like we do a big electric grid where the grid partners can share and protect each other. Water in America is very small in many, many cases. I happen to be, and I need to disclose this, be on the board of American Water, which is the largest water utility in the country. So I spend a lot of time looking at water and its issues. And the vulnerabilities are quite significant because all these little teeny tiny water treatment facilities don't have the resources, the know-how, the technology to really protect themselves effectively in cyber. You need to find out exactly what happened there. If this is a teenager screwing around, fine, discover that. If this is the ends tapping in, uh, we need to know that like now, now, now. And uh, it's a big deal because potentially you could poison thousands of people in this manner. Now, the big one that just happened, of course, is solar winds. People refer to as it as solar winds. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to assume this audience knows all about it, understands it. I'm not going to walk us through it, but I'll make a point about it, which is that we, we tend to call it the solar winds hack because that was the modality that was used to get into this big swath of entities. I, I call it the fire eye hack. Why do I call it the fire eye hack? Because getting into solar winds is like beating a uh, junior high school football team. Getting into fire eye and hanging out in FireEye's networks for 10 months, that's taken down the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, that's a big deal. So A, you know that means there's a big, powerful nation state behind it. B, it's almost certainly Russia looking at the tradecraft involved here. C, we need to understand about it that it was kind of military term here, carpet bombing, very broad swath into 400 or 500, Fortune 500 companies, et cetera. But now the precision guided strikes are following. And that's what we ought to be concerned about. Where are they going? What are they for? Some of it is garden variety espionage activity. Some of it may be signaling to the United States. As we look at Navalny and what's happened, maybe it's a signal to us stand back, stand down, don't try cyber on me, who knows? We need to understand that. So big event, cyber, solar winds and fire eye, tiny little event. They kind of connect in the middle, which is to say they're good indicators of how vulnerable we are in this space. Thank you. And let me uh, just do a follow up on cyber too. both the the uh, those compelling examples that you've helped guide us through. Uh, what do you think about the whole you mentioned uh, IPP IPR intellectual property more generally earlier? What about the whole piracy data dimension when we have consumers who are effectively 
trading or foregoing privacy for access to tech. You know, we have all this uh, platform talk right now. It's in the news today from Australia to, uh, to Europe. Um, how do you see that uh, playing out? Let, let's start by just understanding the magnitude of the challenge here. Um, let's go back to 2011, 10 years ago. There were about 7 billion people on the planet Earth, and there were, coincidentally, about 7 billion devices connected to the internet. Let's go forward to today. Now there's like 7.4 billion people. It's gone up slightly, still roughly 7 billion people. There are 40 billion devices connected to the internet. On the one hand, that's really good. I can pick up my iPhone and I can open my garage door from a thousand miles away. Terrific. Here's the bad news. 40 billion devices are 40 billion points of entry. It's a huge threat surface. And we have allowed, because it's convenient and pleasant to, to move on the internet, we've allowed the blossoming of this magnificent, arguably greatest achievement in human history. But we have not secured it. We have uh, so much vulnerability in this enormous threat surface. So the question I think is, what should we be doing about it? And here we kind of hit your point. Too often, there's a tendency to, to think about responses in this zone as they, though they are an on and an off switch. In other words, either we are just gonna lock down the internet, um, we're gonna guard our privacy perfectly, um, and we're going to start shutting down the, the blossoming, the opening of all this, um, or we're just on and off switch, or we're just not going to worry about it. We're just going to let it rip. We're going to just um, not worry about our security so much. And, you know, there'll be redundancy. We'll overcome it. If a little privacy bleeds into the gutters, then that's fine. It's not an on and off switch, Eric, and you know this. It's a rheostat. You know, it's, it's like the dimmer in your dining room. Um, you can turn up the privacy or you can turn down the privacy. And that's what's happening now in this space. We are in the of uh, design free to which we want to move that rheostat. And I think we're going to find ourselves moving closer to the privacy side of this norm because people um are worried they're worried about their finances they're worried about their personal lives i mean think about what that suit computer you're carrying around in your pocket uh says about you and the sites you've looked at and the photographs you've taken and rapidly deleted and the videos you've made and think you've gotten rid of um there's a lot going on there so that privacy needle i think is dialing up I think that's okay. What we want to be careful of is that we don't allow it to dial up to the degree that we choke off the system. And that uh, is uh, a, a significant concern that needs to be addressed in Silicon Valley as well as in Washington, D.C. Uh, the uh, supercomputer in the pocket point, the important point that you just raised, if we could uh, just leave a marker on that. We've got a uh, pre-submitted question that uh, really touches that point and we'll be super interested, Admiral, to hear how you react to that. Maybe if we could zoom back for a minute to capitalize on your command of geopolitics and ask about impact of COVID and uh, the whole uh, reassessment of global value and supply chains that we've seen. Um, the, uh, the, uh, certainly, uh, uh, that has had a huge technology dimension. Um, and, uh, I, first of all, how do you see the, the balance of tech power, uh, evolving, uh, in the future? Um, you know, uh, how does it stand between, uh, China and U.S.? What about emerging economies? Are we looking at tech haves and haves not, uh, a, you know, the uh, asymmetry. Uh, we have uh, remarkable progress that we're seeing in India now. We've got, you just mentioned Russia in connection with cybersecurity. How are they likely to be? How do you kind of see the big picture uh, uh, materializing? Well, let's start with COVID. And um, as we hopefully work our way 
through this over the next say 12 to 24 months emerge on the other side of COVID. And by the way, people ask, well, what's it going to be like, you know, after COVID? I'm not sure we're going to be having after COVID. I suspect we're going to end up with an annual COVID shot, just like we get an annual flu shot. That's not the worst outcome imaginable. But for our purposes today, let's sort of assume that things start to look normal in 12 months. If they do, who are the winners and losers geopolitically? Uh, China is the big winner. China will come out of this because they were able to contain it first. They got their economy moving strongly the soonest and the quickest. They did it because they have massive authoritarian tools that are not available to leaders in the West, but they will come out uh, very strong. Uh, Europe, I think, comes out in a kind of a neutral position. Um, as always for Europe, the challenge is um, you've got 28 different horses pulling in slightly different directions. And now, of course, you have Great Britain has actually left the European Union, but still kind of part of the economic trade zone, of course. You can't really pull that completely apart. Um, so I think Europe will be uh, will carry some weight or hit some headwinds because of differing views of where to move geopolitically. But let's sort of say they're going to come out in a roughly neutral position. Um, I'm sorry to say, I think the United States will come out diminished. Um, and it is events not only of COVID and our, our mishandling of the situation in so many ways, uh, but also because of the events in the Capitol, the storm of the Capitol, the knock on effect of that reputationally for the United States, all that will, will kind of be a drag. Even as, as I mentioned earlier, you, in my view, have a, a good, strong administration coming in. How those two balance out over the next year, hard to say, but certainly there'll be headwinds as we try and convince others uh, to work with us. That leaves the developing world. So that's really Latin America and the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia, India, Pakistan. That's, you know, three billion plus people. Um, I think there, big challenges ahead, um, simply because of lack of medical infrastructure, the, uh, shall we say, uneven systems of governance across that, that vast zone, um, and the fact that it's going to turn into a kind of a competitive zone between the United States and China, that won't be helpful for any of those areas. Having said that, on the plus side of the ledger, these are young populations, so with some luck, uh, herd immunity may kick in rapidly without massive loss of life. Let us all pray for that. And then secondly, as you mentioned, there are bubbling nodes of technology. I think you're right to point out India, but certainly many other countries in that zone uh, are coming along in, that, in, in those areas. So let us hope the developing world comes out reasonably well on the far side of this thing. I, I do think there are challenges ahead in those economies. Uh, if I could uh, ask you to, to zoom in again on, uh, on uh, Taiwan. We've heard about Taiwan and Taiwan's uh, technology capacity in connection with some of the chip shortages that we're seeing now in auto industry and elsewhere. Uh, how do you see that happening? Is that a potential choke point? And you know, you've already mentioned how that fits into broader, broader Sino-American relations. Um, what's your take on this, please? Yeah, well, let me, um, let me in a moment of shameless self-promotion, I'll say uh, 2034, as you mentioned, is, is the entire of Wired magazine. It's on the newsstand now. So you can read the first half of the book. You still got to wait for it to come out in March. But we talk about this in the novel because I think it will be a real flashpoint between the United States and China. Um, partly that's because of the reasons you just mentioned. And, you know, a lot of Americans don't really have a feel for Taiwan. Um, it's a big economy, probably, not probably, it's in the top 30-ish economies in the world, just the island of Taiwan. It has a population of about 35 million people. Um, great capacity in tech. I was there uh, just before COVID. I had meetings with uh, Madam Tsai, the president, 
Uh, Taiwan has done a remarkable job dealing with COVID um, without the kind of heavy handed authoritarian tools that you see just across the Taiwan Strait in China. They did it through being organized, following the science, wearing masks. It, it's, it's an example to us all. So I am uh, very supportive of Taiwan. I believe that the United States should be as well. That doesn't mean we ought to sign a treaty with Taiwan. It doesn't mean we ought to be having frontline offensive military exercises. But here's your point. The economic engagement points, um, I think, are the way to move in this world. The Taiwanese, from my eye, by and large, have no desire to uh, follow in the footsteps, if you will, of Hong Kong, which was promised, you know, one nation, two systems. Well, that's over. I think the Taiwanese have been watching that closely. They have no desire to jump into that world. Um, we need to help them become a bit of a porcupine, something that uh, the big lion of China probably doesn't want to eat because it's too spiky going down. Give them the right defensive tools, get closer to them. That's my prescription for Taiwan. Great. I've got uh, a couple more questions, uh, but I'd be, before I uh, post them to the Admiral, let me invite uh, this audience again to uh, jump in on that uh, Q&A section. We already have some very uh, interesting uh, entries there, and I'll come back to them momentarily. Um, but uh, before we can uh, read the uh, issue of Wired, Admiral, and get your book in uh, March, could, could you just kind of help us about, you know, where will we be in 2034? What's the, the elevator line that, uh, that uh, you're using? Um, if we play our cards right, and if the Chinese play their cards right, my novel will be on the dustbin of history, that we will have organized ourselves into a system but we will be working together on humanitarian projects. We'll be working together on climate. We'll be competing for markets in the developing world, but not at the point of a bayonet. Um, if we play our cards right, if we formulate a strategy, I think the Chinese will respond in kind. Um, a lot of what's happened over the last decade has to do with internal politics in China. Um, I think that as President Xi apparently has settled himself in power, I think there'll be opportunities to work more effectively with the Chinese. Um, that would be my hope. Um, could it all go wrong? Could the wheels come off? Yeah, that's why I wrote the book, so that we try to make outcome number one, door number one come true, and we don't end up walking through door number two. Thank you for that. Uh, before we turn to uh, broader questions, I want you to know that my screen lit up, Admiral, um, after you made the comment about uh, the US and uh, about some of the obstacles we might be facing. So I was hoping that maybe you could dig a little deeper in that one and then give us some ideas about how we can and should be thinking about broader institutional expansion or reform, you know, to get to those levels that I think we'd all like to see the uh, the country achieve. Yeah, let me let me start with the good news. I am not a declinist about the United States of America. On the other hand, I'm not a triumphalist. I don't think the United States, the sole organizing feature of the international system. It's simply unrealistic. We can't be the world's policemen, nor should we be the world's policemen. But we do have a very significant positive role to play. The reasons are we are blessed with extraordinary geography. We have benign neighbors to the north and south. We have vast natural resources here in the United States. We have oceans to the left and right of us, if you will, to protect us. Geography blesses us. Number two, we have an entrepreneurial spirit. Americans are independent. Sometimes that uh, creates challenges and difficulties in our system, but net net, it's a positive. Number three, we are still a beacon for the world on immigration. People want to come here. Every embassy I went to as Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, all over the world, I'd see lines of people outside a U.S. embassy seeking visas. They want to come here. Talent wants to come here. 
Uh, number four, our university systems are the envy of the world still. Uh, the top 20 universities in the United States, 17 of them are in the United States of America. I, I could go on and on. We have many, many positive attributes. Our challenge as we get through the next decade is going to be what was on display so vividly and tragically in the Capitol building in the United States. It was deep divisions in our society. I think in some ways they're less about policy choices and more about culture and history and where you live in the country and how you were raised and uh, a thousand other things that are frankly harder to untangle than policy questions. So we can do anything if we can do it together. Um, so I'll, I'll close um, with three kind of practical things that I always suggest, because I get this question, as you can imagine, constantly, both internationally and here at home. Number one, we had to celebrate service here in America. And, and people who say to me, which they do, and I appreciate it, hey, Admiral, thank you for your service, not just the military. There are so many ways to serve this country. It's certainly the military, but our diplomats, our CIA officers, Peace Corps volunteers, firemen, policemen, nurses and doctors on the front lines of COVID, school teachers in rural Florida teaching a packed classroom under COVID strictures for 37,000. You think she's serving the country? Boy, I do. I could go on and on. Service is nonpartisan. It's bipartisan, if you will. We need to celebrate service. Number two, education. We need to do better at science, technology, engineering, math, STEM, for sure, if we want to compete in the cyber world. But we need to also simply educate people and old people as well how to use these things properly, how to differentiate between what is sewer water running through the pipes and what is true and real and accurate reporting. So education, I think, is number two. And number three, uh, voting. We need to vote. And my view, the simplest solution that could help bring us together would be to find candidates who are willing to bring us together. I'll give you a practical example. Um, I lived in Massachusetts for five years as Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Massachusetts is arguably the most liberal state in the country, the most democratic, a Republican governor, a guy named how does a Republican get elected to the, to the governorship of the most liberal country, uh, liberal state in the country? The answer is Charlie Baker works every single day trying to reach across aisles. He's a Republican. My representative was a Democrat, a guy named Seth Moulton. He ran for president, young guy, veteran, very charismatic. Seth is a Democrat, but he relentlessly reaches across aisles. He's part of something called the Problem Solvers Caucus working with the other side. Those are the kind of candidates we want to seek out, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. And I'll close by saying, by the way, you may be wondering about, what about me? I'm a registered independent. I've been, never been a Republican, never been a Democrat, career military officer. I'm a centrist. I'm a moderate. But listen, I'm talking to you, whether you are watching Fox day long, starting with the people on the white couch, wrapping up with Sean Hannity, or you are MSNBC all the way uh, with Morning Joe, and you can't imagine a night where you haven't seen Rachel Maddow. I'm talking to you. We have got to start together voting for candidates who want to do that. Education, celebrate service, go thank a teacher, talk to people about serving the country. That will help us pull us together. There's three practical ideas for you. That's absolutely terrific, Admiral. And uh, may I propose now that we go into a kind of a lightning round? I've got a lot of questions, and I, there, it's clear that you've generated a lot of interest uh, from uh, folks on this call. Uh, let me begin with this one. It's a follow-up on uh, the whole issue of a role of China and Russia. Um, China and Russia's use of technology to suppress domestic dissidents has come up on terms of democracy. 
do you expect this trend to continue given their technological strength? Or do you think that democratization of technology poses an existential threat to those systems? Yeah, this of course is maybe the big question of our times is uh, democracy, will it prevail in the face of these authoritarian uh, regimes? I think it will. Let, let's, let's look at uh, Russia and China. They have always been authoritarian states. I mean, going back thousands of years in the case of China, uh, but really both China and Russia have always been authoritarian, nothing new there. I think the questioner is correct over time, and it'll be an uneven race, over time, democracy will prevail. And a big part of the reason is the transparency and the acceleration that come with the internet. That's why we're fighting so hard against it. It's a losing battle for them over the decades to come. There'll be some winners and losers in the near term bet on democracy. Great. Um, sorry, these, I'm, I'm just going to give you these questions the way they're coming in, Admiral P. They're not as, uh, I haven't been able to shape them, but we have a question from the, uh, the, um, the semiconductor industry um, that uh, uh, is along the lines of the following. We sell equipment to both China and the U.S., and we view our position as an asset relative to other US-based semiconductor companies, would you agree that this agnostic position helps other European companies tech? Um, I do agree with that. And um, my own work at the Carlisle Group, private equity firms in the country, um, we, do, we do deals in China. Um, I am for business engagement. It is one of the areas in which we uh, can find zones of cooperation. And I think that um, even in the midst of wanting to onshore some really, truly critical national security uh, systems, there's still plenty of room for maneuver across all of these zones. And I do look at firms that are capable of dealing with both sides as uh, net positives in terms of helping us avoid uh, the war with China that we've talked about. All right, uh, next question shows the span of interests in our viewers, uh, Admiral. Um, how will tech blocks evolve, asked the writer. Uh, as tech is driven by national security, long-term leadership concerns versus economic and trade, what you talked about earlier, of course. In that context, will trade discussions have the ability to decouple from these technology considerations? Yeah, this is um, a fascinating question. I, I think that uh, trade will continue. Let, let's make a comparison here. Sometimes people say, oh, are we in a new Cold War? Thinking back to the Cold War of the US and the Soviet Union, and, and we're not. Um, that Cold War, massive nuclear arsenal, was almost zero trade between the two blocks. Um, two navies at sea that were playing Hunt for Red October with a finger on a button to launch missiles. We're not remotely in that zone with China. And if we play our cards right, construct a strategy, we won't get to that point. Um, so in today's world, yes, there are tensions. I discussed them. Each of them can be addressed. Trade, I think, is going to be the, the best path we have forward. Uh, in order to avoid stumbling into a, a serious Cold War. You know, having said all that, Eric, Henry Kissinger, who has quite literally forgotten more about China than I'm ever going to know, uh, his book on China is magnificent, mandatory reading for this conversation. Henry Kissinger says, we are in the foothills of a, of a Cold War with China. I think if you asked him today, he would say, we're even a little further up that mountain. Uh, we really don't want to get to the top of the mountain. All right. Um, I, I, I wish we could keep you uh, all day, Admiral, but uh, I, I'm, I, I'm mindful of the fact that we're running out of time here. Uh, two quick questions. I mentioned earlier that we had a question about that supercomputer in the pocket uh, comment that you made about smartphones. And this pertains to Russia's advances in leveraging 
uh, smartphones of NATO and Ukrainian soldiers to better direct our artillery or other weapon system, learn about operations, et cetera, et cetera. And the uh, writer says that a former NATO chief for emerging threats describes smartphones as the alliance's soft belly. Um, how do you see that from the standpoint of smartphones and military operations? Absolutely accurate. And um, in the U.S. military has a whole coded sequence it goes through from peacetime operations where a soldier or a sailor uh, can use his or her smartphone quite freely um, and, and it simply marches toward conflict. You know, we go to red zone, yellow zone, green zone, um, and we gradually shut them down. And you absolutely have to. And as I would guess your listener knows, even if you turn them off, uh, they can still be tapped I don't want to get too much into that on an unsecure line, but you, when you're really at the far end of this, you take those devices and they're in a, they're, I'll just say they're protected from that. So let's, let's stipulate that yes, it is correct. And particularly when you look at less sophisticated militaries um, who don't have the same level of technology appreciation of the United States, um, that's where the risk is in those I don't want to name countries, but less sophisticated militaries, even in the NATO alliance. This brings up one other point I want to make, which is um, we talk a lot about the authoritarians in tech. We had to spend more time thinking about the democracies in tech. And if you think about it, the way the world is constructed right now in, from a governance perspective, you've got the United Nations, you know, like 180 nations are in that and you kind of work your way down to the G20. Well, the G20 has a lot of authoritarian nations that are in it. Then you get down to the G7, used to be the G8. We threw Russia out. But even the G7 is not quite the right mix of both democracy and tech. Um, a number of people are talking about a league of techno technotic democracies or democracies with tech. Um, you see it with different terms. I think there's a good idea there. And, you know, you kind of pick, there are about 12 nations that are really technologically advanced, but are also democracies. That would be a very interesting forum to add to the other four that we talked about a moment ago. All right. We have so many more questions, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe we could end with a question um, on, your, uh, on your vision uh considerable as it is uh here it is if you had to make a prediction will nato still be relevant 25 years from now and what are the proof points you will be looking for in the years to come on whether this prediction is moving in the right direction um i think nato will be relevant and i'll, I'll give you uh, three or four very quick points why uh, number one is geography. Geography is not going to change, right? I think we can all agree to that. So for the United States, the geographic location of Europe is important. It's a place where we can have our bases, a place where we can be uh, stage forward and, and therefore then operate in our security interests in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia. So geography is not going to change that transatlantic bridge will continue to be important. Number two is technology. Um, this is our highest tech pool of partners in the world. When you collectively look at what the UK, Germany, France in particular, but really the rest of Europe bring to the table. Um, Japan is very good, Australia is very good. We have other allies and connections, but as a pool of partners, technology. Number three, um, it, it's simply values. It's sharing democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, gender equality, racial equality. Look, we execute those values imperfectly. They are the right values. And nowhere else do we find that size a pool of partners uh, together who have been willing to stand with us. So I remain pretty confident, and I'll close on, if you will, the negative side of the proof point, which is, Will there still be threats out there in 25 years? Yeah, um, I think Russia will continue to be a threat. I don't look for an epiphany. 
with the way things are going, Vladimir Putin will probably be alive in his 90s making trouble for us. China is not going to have a sudden epiphany. By the way, NATO is working more uh, dealing with uh, China, um, et, et cetera. The Arctic is going to bubble up in importance. What we've been talking about for an hour, cyber, is not going to go away as a threat area. So given that there will be challenges out there and given the pluses that I mentioned, those are four, if you will, proof points that for my money, say NATO will continue to be uh, quite relevant. Thank you, Admiral. I know that you'll be interested, as am I, about how anyone could capture the tour de force that you've just given us uh, in a drawing. But Diana, would it be possible for you, please, to bring up uh, your work here? We'd love to see uh, what you've come up with. And uh, uh, we'll be sending this out, of course, to all. Yeah, sure. If you enlarge my profile picture, you'll be able to see what I've done so far. Oh, my God. There gosh. we are. Now All right. Well, with that extraordinary, congratulations, Diana. And uh, Admiral, uh, as I knew and expected, you've given us a, really a, a tour de force in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the most significant uh, sense of the expression. Uh, please accept our sincerest appreciation for your continued engagement with Carney and for coming back. Uh, we're so delighted uh, that you've uh, given us this time. Thank you so very much. It's my pleasure. Let's uh, do it in person next time. Thanks, everybody. Look, look forward to that. And ladies and gentlemen, we'd also like to invite you to put uh, our next session on your calendar uh, with the, the uh, I'm sure, a very close uh, colleague of the Admiral, the president of Brookings Institution, uh, General John Allen, who has recently co-authored a book on artificial intelligence uh, and uh, is doing a lot of work in that area, especially from the, the uh, policy side. Uh, these are the beginning, the opening salvos, since we're in the, the uh, national security frame, of what will be um, a set of conversations that will also track a number of particulars on the future of technology, everything from talent to uh, core areas of uh, development in the future, supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot more to come. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, best wishes. Thank you. Thank you.